NASA chooses another lunar lander for Artemis, the first radiation belt ever seen outside the solar system. And those impossible galaxies might be even more massive than we thought. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. When the crew of Artemis 3 arrive at the moon in a couple of years, maybe 2026, I'm not really sure, uh, they're going to transfer from their Orion capsule into a modified starship. And then they're going to use starship to land onto the surface of the moon, get outside, do their science, go back in, return to lunar orbit, and then return on their Orion capsule. This was a big contract that SpaceX won with NASA from other competitors to provide this landing service to the moon. And so this week we learned that NASA has awarded another lunar landing contract to Blue Origin. And this is going to be providing the landing services for the astronauts on Artemis 5, which hopefully will be landing in 2029. And this spacecraft looks very different from the SpaceX Starship, a lot more like a traditional lunar lander, the kind of thing you saw in the Apollo era, very specialized for this purpose of getting astronauts from orbit down to the surface of the moon. The lander is going to be called Blue Moon. And what makes it very different from the SpaceX Starship is it's going to be fueled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. This is a very tricky fuel to use in space because it has to be kept extremely cold. And liquid hydrogen is a very difficult fuel to keep in any kind of container. It's always trying to escape. And so having a way to keep your fuel cold in space and not letting it gas out is going to be a big challenge. And in order to be able to provide these landing services, they're going to need to be able to refuel this system in space. And this has never been done before. It's going to be launched on a new Glenn rocket that's never been done before. So there's a lot of steps that have to come between now and 2029. And as part of the contract, Blue Origin has got to demonstrate that they can launch this thing, refuel it in space, simulate what it's going to take to be able to bring humans down to the surface of the moon in the same way that SpaceX has to do this with Starship. I'm sure in the comments, a lot of you are going to start making uh, disparaging remarks about like whether or not this is going to even happen. But I think what's really important is that NASA is choosing multiple providers to provide this service in the same way that they were looking for multiple providers to provide human launch services to the International Space Station. You've got the SpaceX Crew Dragon and you've got the Starliner. Now we're still waiting for the Starliner to do it, but it'll be soon. And then you've got competition. You've got multiple choices. You've got redundancy and we want this. You want to have multiple providers providing landing services to the moon. Even if you're a giant SpaceX fan, you should be even more interested in competition in multiple providers, redundancy, having a way for people to get to the surface of the moon, no matter what happens in the future. NASA might have found the Hakuto R crash site or landing site. So a couple of episodes ago, I talked about the Hakuto R lunar lander. This is a Japanese privately built lunar lander. It had originally been developed for the Google Lunar X prize. And then when that was canceled, they decided they were going to still go ahead with it and try to land on the surface of the moon, operate, and then provide a platform for future missions to go to the moon. If people want to send experiments and so on, we watched live as they made their landing attempt on the moon and the lander got closer and closer to the surface. And then communications got cut off and it was assumed that it crashed. And now we've got some images of the landing site from the lunar reconnaissance orbiter. And what's cool is you can see these blink images. You can see the before and the after and see that additional features show up in the image. Now we're not entirely sure what it is that we're looking at here. Like, are we looking at a successful landing? Or are we looking at a crash? Uh, more information is still necessary. But I think at this point, controllers don't think they have any hope to be able to contact the spacecraft and that these images will help them figure out exactly what happens. So they can fix it for next time. The first ever radiation belt seen outside our solar system. I'm sure you're familiar with the radiation belts around the Earth. These are trapped radiation that are held in place by the Earth's global magnetosphere. And we see similar fields of trapped radiation around Jupiter, around Saturn. There's even one around Ganymede. So these radiation belts are common across the solar system. But now astronomers have seen a radiation belt for the first time outside of the solar system. But it's not a planet. 
it's around a ultra cool dwarf star. So think about a really small, really cool red dwarf star. Astronomers use radio telescopes to analyze the area around this red dwarf star, and they were able to actually map out the shape of the field of the radiation belts around this star. It's very similar in sort of shape and form to the radiation belts that we see around Jupiter, but it is about 10 times brighter because there's just much more powerful magnetic fields going on here. And we know that there are radiation belts around the sun. And so it's really interesting to get this other data point. And so now after a while, astronomers will be able to map out more and more of these radiation belts around different stars, try and get a sense of how the radiation activity connects to their flare activity, and really get a better sense of just like how the universe works. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, didn't we already find a magnetic field around another star in the form of an exoplanet? And yes, astronomers did detect the emissions, essentially the aurora emissions of a planet interacting with its star, a magnetosphere, but it wasn't mapped. It was just that the photons of radiation coming from the magnetosphere were detected. Now I've got a whole interview on this topic and you can check that out here. ESO has a new system for telescope time. There are a lot of big telescopes around the world and in space. And even though there are many of these, they're oversubscribed. There are more research projects that are submitted to these telescopes than they have time for them to do the work. And so each one of these telescopes has an advisory panel where they sit down, they look at all of the proposals, they make recommendations for which ones will give the greatest scientific benefit, and then they're allocated time on the telescope. But the problem is, is that the team who is evaluating all of these proposals, they're busy. And in many cases, they might not have specialties that match the kinds of proposals that are being made. So the European Southern Observatory, these are the people behind some of the biggest telescopes in the world, like the very large telescope, the upcoming extremely large telescope. So they have come up with a new system that they're calling a distributed peer review. And what happens is that when you put in your application to use one of these telescopes, you'll have to agree that you will look over other people's proposals and give some feedback and you provide the expertise that you have in different subject areas. Then when your proposal goes in, you're also given other papers that you have to look at and provide some feedback that helps the committee figure out what are going to be the most impactful scientific proposals. ESOs use this system for the most recent observing run and they found it's very effective. It's helped save time. It's helped let the better proposals rise to the surface. And this could very well be a standard that other telescopes use going into the future. Those impossible galaxies might be even more impossible. This is fun, because we're seeing science unfold in real time, back and forth as new evidence is being gathered. And I think I love to watch how this process unfolds. So you might remember this idea of the impossible galaxies. These were galaxies that were seen in a survey from JWST data that were much larger and more massive than astronomers had predicted should appear at that point in the universe. And I actually did an interview with one of the researchers behind this and we talked about their discovery and what the implications are for cosmology. And then researchers used simulations of the universe and compared these galaxies to their predictions and found no, they're not impossible. They're actually the kind of thing that you might expect to see in the universe that we have. Well, now researchers have evaluated these galaxies more carefully and found that they might be even more massive than originally believed, possibly 10 times more massive. So what they did was they selected five really interesting galaxies from the survey, and they wanted to figure out are these individual galaxies that are just extremely massive? Or are they a collection of galaxies, a cluster of galaxies, where it's just so far away that you can't tell whether or not it's a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. They examined each pixel of the image and found that it was more likely that they were looking at individual galaxies and not cluster of galaxies. And that meant that these galaxies really were massive, even more massive than had been originally estimated. But the problem is that these galaxies are right at the limit of what JWST can observe. They're going to need more 
gravitational lensing where you've got very massive galaxy clusters in the foreground that are lensing background galaxies providing more magnification. So you really can estimate the size and shape of these galaxies properly. And again, this is really exciting. Like, yeah, you're going to hear us go back and forth. Oh, they're small. Oh, they're large. Oh, they're small. And this is fine. This is how this process works as more and more votes are cast as more evidence is gathered as the evidence is reevaluated. And astronomers eventually hone in on what is the most likely result. And we don't know what it's going to be. And I can't wait to find out. I, it, like it amazes me that people have a like people will post in the comments. I guess like people just don't understand science that that science is done in this way, transparently, where you can gain new evidence and overturn the results of what somebody else said, and then they can gain new evidence and overturn the results of what you said and people are watching and are having conversations about each piece of research and they're reevaluating re every single building block that goes up into your discovery. And, and imagine if the rest of human society use that same technique to evaluate everything that we do the way we live our lives. And we don't we make assumptions, we fall into uh, standard ways of thinking, we beg the question, we assume the outcome, we ignore the evidence that is against our beliefs. And I think human progress is held back from us being transparent and revealing stuff in real time. So after every Space Bites episode, we put up a vote in the community where you can vote on the story that you thought was the best. And so last week's stories, the one that people were most excited about was Juice extending its antenna. Can't argue with that one. I thought it was great. And then the second place one was the new way to measure the expansion of the universe. After this episode of Space Bites, we'll put up the vote and definitely go there and pick the story that you like the best. And that gives us feedback that tells us the kinds of stories that you're interested in. And also just like tells us what you're excited about. And make sure you subscribe to the channel and then it will appear in your feed when we post the new poll. A fast radio burst that went through a star. Fast radio bursts are one of these mysteries that astronomers are on their way to figure out what it is that caused them. These are these really bright flashes in radio waves. They can just last a few milliseconds and they clearly are coming from a very energetic event. They're coming from galaxies that are billions of light years away. And the problem with studying them is that they appear randomly across the sky and very few of them repeat in any way. And so you have to pretty much just be watching the entire sky to be able to see one of them. And astronomers aren't entirely sure what causes them, but it seems to have something to do with neutron stars or maybe magnetars, very extreme magnetic fields that release suddenly and and send out this flash of radio waves. Astronomers got lucky when they saw a recent flash where the light coming from this fast radio burst was polarized in a way that told the astronomers that the light had passed through the atmosphere of another star. And this might be a clue to what's causing them. They were able to see that the source of this fast radio burst is in some kind of binary system where you have a magnetar, a very extreme neutron star with these magnetic fields was in orbit around a star. And then somehow the interactions between the star and the magnetar were the cause of the fast radio burst. Fast radio burst blasted off, went through the atmosphere of its binary companion and astronomers were able to see it here on Earth. And so this might be one really important clue to get to the bottom of what is causing these fast radio bursts. As you're watching this episode of Space Bites, I'm sure you have questions. There's a lot of astronomy, a lot of cosmology, a lot of space flight, there are implications, there are ideas, maybe there are problems, things you don't understand. Well, good news, you can have all of your questions answered with my weekly 
questions and answers show. We record this show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time, but then we've got a playlist of every single episode that we've done and they've been edited down. They've got really cool graphics that go along with it. And so if you have questions about any of the topics in this episode, as well as just like any space topics in general, go ahead, put them into the comments on this video. And then I gather a bunch of them up and I answer them in the question show as well as tackle questions live. We also do an ask me anything style of question show where people can ask questions about the operations of universe today, how we choose our stories, how we deal with artificial intelligence, as well as sort of my philosophy about space news and science and things like that. And that is on the patron only feed. So if you want to join that, join our Patreon. go to patreon.com slash universe today. There could be strange matter inside neutron stars. You get a neutron star when a star with many times the mass of the sun explodes as a supernova and the neutron star is the result. But the size of the neutron star depends on the mass of the star itself. And if it's a really massive star, you don't get a neutron star, but you get a black hole. And so there's this like spectrum of neutron stars from the least massive neutron star to the most massive neutron star. And it's believed that when a neutron star gets even more massive, it will collapse into a black hole. And now researchers are proposing that the most massive types of neutron stars, ones that are right on the edge of becoming a black hole actually have layers inside of them, like onions or ogres. And so on the outer part of the neutron star, you have the neutrons where the protons and the electrons are smushed together with so much force that they turn into neutrons. But there's even more force inside the star. And so it's believed that then this additional force breaks apart neutrons into their component quarks. And so you have this soup of quarks of strange matter inside the neutron star. And this core could be one kilometer wide across of like a soup of quarks and a little more mass coming into the neutron star and it fully collapses into a black hole, a polar cyclone on Uranus. Uranus takes 84 years to orbit the sun and it is flipped over onto its side. And when you think about sort of the orbital dynamics of it, that means that we only get a chance to see, say, the North Pole of Uranus once every 84 years. The last time we were able to see the North Pole of Uranus, radio telescopes were in their infant stages, like this was back in the 40s. So now we have enormous arrays of telescope worldwide collections of telescopes that are able to turn and watch Uranus. And one of the interesting new discoveries made was that Uranus, like the other planets with atmospheres in the solar system, has a polar vortex. And astronomers weren't sure this was going to be there because Uranus is rotated over onto its side. And while Jupiter and Saturn and Earth and Mars all are orbiting perpendicular to the sun, Uranus is flipped over on its side. And so would you get a polar vortex at the poles in the same way that you get them on these other planets? And the answer is yes, that clearly the dynamics of having this planet rotate and having different amounts of solar energy hitting it creates this polar vortex. But like the pictures are are awesome. And it's really cool to see that even a planet that is so bizarre still has some familiar features. And it just like another reason we need to send a mission back to Uranus. All right, those are all the news stories that we had today. If you want to dive deeper into any of them, we have links in the show notes down below. You can get even more space news in my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent and keeps ads at a bare minimum. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to just Paul Davis, Vlad Shipelin, Jay Dennis, David Giltonen, Modso, George, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbioff, Andrew Gross, and Josh Schultz who support us at the master of the universe level. All your support means the universe to us. 
All right, that was all the news that we had today. We'll see you next week.